blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you on RTN Christian TV in Scotland and also on Moriel TV. Thank you so much for joining us for Word for the Weekend, Word for the Weekend. Before we begin, just to remind you, we have a midweek Bible study on Moriel TV. Uh, UK time is 7 o'clock on Thursday. We'll be continuing our studies in the book of Philippians, beginning with Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, next Thursday, Lord willing. We also uh, would remind you to visit our website. Uh, lots of free material, downloadable Bible teachings of all sorts, and a variety of, of, of other things that many Christians find helpful, all free of charge on moriel.org. Uh, moriel.org, please join us there. Finally, uh, we'd just like to thank you for being with us for Word for the Weekend. But remember, uh, if you can meet with other Christians, if you can have a house group or something like this despite COVID, we encourage people to be in physical fellowship. Internet can be, for the time being at least, a good ancillary provision during this difficult time. But if you're able to actually meet with other believers, we would encourage you to do so, providing the doctrine is right and so forth. Be that as it may, tonight we're looking at the book of Isaiah, chapter 22. Isaiah 22, Ishayahu Hanavi, the Valley of Vision, the Valley of Vision. Now, a lot of the things I'm going to say tonight might not have much meaning to new believers or to the newly saved. Bear with me. I would also point people to the book, Shadows of the Beast, how the Antichrist will be identified to the faithful church. That book is a good background to some of the things, or most of the things we're going to be looking at this evening from Isaiah, the 22nd chapter. We might refer to this as the master counterfeiter or the master counterfeit. Isaiah chapter 22, I'm convinced, in verse 1, the valley of vision. Uh, I went through this text carefully, and I went through it with my wife in Hebrew very carefully. And uh, we do believe, I certainly believe, it is a crucial portion for the things that are coming. The oracle concerning the valley of vision. What is the matter with you now that you have all gone up to the housetops? You who were filled with noise, you who were boisterous, a boisterous town. You exultant city, you were slain, were not slain with the sword, nor did they die in battle. All your rulers have fled together and have been captured without the bow. All of you who were found were taken captive together though they had fled far away. Therefore, I say, turn your eyes away from me. Let me weep bitterly. Do not try to comfort me concerning the destruction of the daughter of my people. For the Lord, God of hosts, has a day of panic, subjugation and confusion in the valley of vision, a breaking down of walls and a crying to the mountains. Now, obviously, this is following the Assyrian captivity of the 10 northern tribes, but it is at the approach to the impending Babylonian captivity, circa 585, 586 BC, that is coming. Now, the text is comparing the Babylonian invasion to something that's going to happen at the end of the age, the day of the Lord. And this, of course, relates to the Babylon motif in Revelation chapters 17 and 18, but I only mention this in passing. Also, the term vision. One of the Hebrew words for vision is chazon, chazon. And in Hebrew, the book of Revelation is translated chazon Yohanan, the vision of John. Hence, we descend into the valley of vision. Again, verse 5, the Lord of hosts has a day of panic, subjugation and confusion in the valley of vision, a breaking down of walls and a crying to the mountains. Elam took up the quiver with the chariots 
entered thee in horsemen, and Kir uncovered the shield. Then your choicest valleys were filled with chariots. Your horsemen took up fixed positions at the gate, and he removed the defense of Judah. And that day you depended on the weapons of the house of the forest, and you saw the breaches in the wall of the city of David were many, and you collected the waters of the lower pool. Then you counted the houses of Jerusalem and tore down houses to fortify your wall. <coughs> you made a reservoir between two walls for the waters of the old pool. Now this could refer to the waters coming into Hezekiah's tunnel that Hezekiah himself dug going into the pool of Siloam. Okay, still there, well excavated. But you did not depend on him who made it, nor did you take into consideration him who planned it long ago. Therefore, on that day, the Lord God of hosts called you to weeping, to wailing, to shaving the head and to wearing sackcloth. Instead, there is gaiety and gladness, killing of cattle and slaughtering of sheep, eating of meals and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we may die. The hedonistic philosophy of the world Paul says, if Christ is not risen, if Christ is not risen, if it is not a historical fact that Jesus has risen from the dead, that philosophy is the only philosophy of the world that makes sense. That is the right philosophy. It is the correct philosophy to live by if Christ is not risen. Pure hedonism. Eat, drink, and be buried. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we'll be buried. That is a totally hedonistic philosophy, and it's the only philosophy that makes sense according to the New Testament if Christ has not risen. But praise God, Christ has risen, and he's coming again. But we continue. But the Lord of hosts revealed himself to me. Surely this iniquity not, shall not be forgiven you until you die, says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, come, go to this steward, to Shivna, who was in charge of the royal household. What right do you have here? And whom do you have here? That you have hewn a tomb for yourself here, that is in the tombs of the kings. And you who a tomb on the height. You who carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. In other words, believing you have some kind of eternal sense of security posthumously because you're in a correct relationship with the Lord. But they were looking to the burial site as a guarantee, like being buried on consecrated ground, irrespective of where the person, Shivna, was actually at in his real walk with God or his lack of it. But let's look. And it's amazing, you see people don't let evangelical preachers be buried in consecrated ground in the Church of England, adopted also from the Roman Catholic Church. They did the same thing. In Judaism, it's another practice, being buried in a Jewish cemetery. You won't be buried on consecrated ground, and the ultra-Orthodox won't bury you if there's tattoos or you married a Christian or something like this. There's all kinds of things. This idea that as long as you're interred, as long as your remains are buried in the right place, you are somehow secure. Look what people look to for salvation. It's amazing. But it's not a new practice. Let us continue to look at this. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, come, go to the steward to Shevna, who's in charge of the royal household. Again, what right do you have to be here? You, you've you hooned a tomb for yourself. You carve a resting place in the rock. But in verse 17, behold, the Lord is about to hurl you headlong, O man. And he is about to grasp you firmly and roll you tightly like a ball to be cast into a vast country. There you will die. There your splendid chariots will be. You shame of your master's house. 
I will depose you from office. I will pull you down from your station. And it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely around him. Now, this refers to priestly garments, priestly garments. I will entrust him with your authority, and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. The next two verses are very difficult to interpret. So they will hang on him all the glory of his father's house, offspring and issue, all the least of the vessels, from the bowls to all the jars. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg driven in a firm place will give way. It'll even break off and fall and the load hanging on it will be cut off, for the Lord has spoken. Doom was impending. Judgment was coming. But as it was coming, the people became celebratory, celebratory. They were having big parties. It was almost like Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death. They became oblivious to the fact that what was impending, they thought it wouldn't happen. Isaiah saw what was coming. Isaiah, of course, was followed by Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but Isaiah was probably the first who saw what was really going to happen on the horizon. And he talked about what the people were doing. He talked about how they were caught up in celebrating, how they were caught up in making merry. That's what they were doing. The Instead of repentance, that is represented by the shaving of the head and wearing sackcloth, there is gaiety of gladness. I recall some years ago, back in the early 1990s, we're talking probably well, maybe 18 years ago or 17 years ago, the Lord led us to do a conference in, in Great Britain, actually it was in Wales, uh, called Preparing for Persecution. And it was a two-part conference, Preparing for Persecution, and we couldn't get all the people into one conference. We had to do the same conference twice. We didn't have a facility at that time large enough to get everyone in. So we did preparing for persecution. But we did this at a time when the mainstream evangelical churches were caught up in the laughing and drunken counterfeit revival that came from Toronto, Canada, and then its American clone from Pensacola and so forth. These people were saying, prepare for a blessing, prepare for revival, prepare for victory. And they were on the floor in hysterics, and they were imitating or behaving like they were inebriated, literally drunk on alcohol, and all this kind of stuff. And some of it was quite carnal. And frankly, some of it, as you know, I believe, was even demonic. And it was going on like this. And the Lord led us to say, it's not going to be what they think. It's going to be different. Prepare for persecution a persecution will be coming. When, we don't know, but the Lord said to prepare for it 18 years ago. Most of us think we're seeing the approaching uh, rudiments of it already in Britain and in other countries, certainly Australia, Canada, etc. particularly. But let's look at this. This is not a new phenomenon. People would prefer to celebrate, to believe a lie, 
to make merry, to think everything is happy clappy, ignoring the genuine spiritual moral state of the nation and even of the church, much as happened with Israel. Then something else happened. They began to fortify themselves. They began to rely on their own provisions for the attack, uh, for what was coming. They tore down houses to build up extra fortifications on the walls of Jerusalem. They were storing up water so that they would not be dehydrated by a siege, cutting off the water supply from the Kidron. They th made all of these strategic preparations, but they were not repenting. Isaiah says, the Lord told me these strategic preparations aren't going to work. You're not going to stop what's coming. It's going to happen. Please repent. Only the Lord can intervene. And we see this today. I've seen everything from Christians caught up in the survivalist movement to with the Y2K, they were storing food and all this stuff in basements and things like this saying that the Lord told him to do it. And in fact, nothing happened. Now, I wasn't against people having some extra food and, and batteries and things like that, but there were people who were obsessed with this in 1999, as the year 2000 approached. I've seen this happen various times. I'm seeing the same kind of thing happen now in certain circles with COVID. People are relying on their own means and their own strength to prepare for what's coming. Now, I'm not discounting the element of common sense by any means, but we can't secure our position. Only the Lord can secure us. And we need to realize these things we see happening are God's judgments. God is allowing these things happen to happen, not only to the nation and society, but judgment begins in the house of God. As we've been warning, the COVID crisis is making it difficult, in some cases impossible, for mega churches to meet their mortgage payments and so forth. Uh, these are things that were built on the drive of man instead of the initiative of the Holy Spirit in many cases. This is God's judgment. It's the Lord dealing not just with the unbeliever, but with the believer. <coughs> We need to be in tune with this ourselves in our own lives. And I speak for all of us, myself certainly included. But let's look at this. Someone gets control of the temple. He's a person who was well connected, but he was not appointed or anointed to be in control of the temple worship, the Levitical priesthood, or any of this. And we read about him. His name is Shivna, Shivna. He was in charge of the royal household. Now, right away there, we see the royal household. Pay attention. We've explained this before many times, but for our newer listeners. A king had to be a descendant of David from the tribe of Judah. A high priest had to be a descendant of Aaron from the tribe of Levi. The two could not be one. Only the Messiah had a right to be both king and priest. In Christ, in the new covenant, we are kings, but he's the king of kings. We are priests, but he, Jesus, is the high priest. In the Old Testament, when one king burned incense in the temple, as if he were a priest, God smote him with leprosy. Uh, king John Hodakatus in the intertestamental period was a high priest who made himself king, and a spiritual mess came about as a result of what happened in the Hasmonean period uh, that set the stage for the whole religious political debacle that Jesus walked into when he was born. Uh, again, I only mention these things in passing. 
This is somebody who had no right to function as a religious Levitical figure, and he was not the king. He simply was a bureaucrat. He was somebody who was connected to the royal family or to the royal throne. That is the house of David, legitimately the house of David, but from which the Messiah would ultimately come. But he does something. He does something. There's iniquity. And he tries to make himself immortal. But we're told the Lord is going to hurl you headlong. He's going to grasp you firmly and roll you tightly like a ball. You're the shame of your master's house. I will depose you from office, the Lord says. I will pull you down from your station. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim, and I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash secretly about him. Only the Messiah could be both king and priest. Notice he's wearing the garments wrongly. God is going to take the tunic and the sash off of him. Now, this relates further, of course, to the special vestments of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. I won't go into that now, but he's going to take these garments from you that you have no right to wear and put it on the one who God designates who does have the right to wear it. And I'll entrust him with your authority. You have the authority now. I'm taking it away from you and giving it to another. He'll become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus has the key of David. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one opens. Jesus, the Messiah. It's a messianic prophecy, but it is pointing ahead to the deposition of the one who puts himself in place of Christ and attempts to usurp his position. I'll drive him like a peg in a firm place. He'll become a throne of glory to his father's house. So they will hang on him all the glory of his father's house, offspring and issue, all the least of the vessels from the bowls to the jars. That is the sacrificial uh, pottery and so forth used in the in, 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 in brazen brass pottery used in temple worship for the collection of blood and so forth. And that day declares the Lord, the peg driven in a firm place will give way. It'll break off and fall, and the load hanging on it will be cut off. The Lord has spoken. What does this speak of? Notice, the one who is in this position, we are told, is cut off, destroyed by the Lord. And another is put in that position. The term used is nikrat, nikrat, not destroyed, but pierced through, cut through. You will always see this. Satan is destroyed. The Lord is injured. Because of the resurrection, it's not permanent. You will bruise him in the heel. That's Jesus. He will crush your head, bruise you in the head. That's the serpent. That's Satan. Okay. Well, here it's the same. The term that God is going to destroy him is only found for Shivna. But God is going to cut into, cut into the Messiah. Let's look at Daniel chapter 9, 
verses 24 and 25, please. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place, the temple. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It'll be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, circa 32 AD, CE, even in times of distress. And the people of the prince who is to come, that being Rome, will destroy the city and sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood, even to the end, there will be war and desolations are determined. He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, seven years, one seven. But in the middle of the week, the seven years, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come the one who makes desolate, as we've said many times, the abomination of desolation. It was partially fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes in the Hanukkah story, but Jesus said it happens at the close of the age. Even until the complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, if you're a young believer, this is hard to follow. I understand that. Daniel was told the future in terms of sets of seven years. The Hebrew word for seven and week is the same, hence the 70 weeks. There's a 69th week with a hiatus, a gap in the middle before the 70th week comes. During that, that's the age of the church and the times of the Gentiles and so forth. During that period, mainly the age of the church. The Antichrist will come and make a covenant with Israel. He'll deceive the Jews and others, and he will break that covenant halfway through and set up an image of himself in the temple. But we're told he will come there, but the Messiah will be cut off. Now, this tells us the prince who is to come being Rome, that the Antichrist will come out of a reconfederated Roman Empire in some way. Be careful of those who are saying that the Antichrist will come from Islam. That is something that only has a germ of truth in it. He has to come from a reconfederated Roman Empire, the prince who is to come. The Messiah will be cut off. That's what it's talking about. But the Messiah is not cut off permanently. He comes back. And when he comes back, the Antichrist, the final Caesar, as it were, is deposed. Look with me, please, to Ezekiel 21. Verses 25 to 27. And you, O slaying wicked one, the prince of Israel, he's going to come as the prince of Israel, whose day has come in the time of the punishment of the end, something at the close of the age. Thus says the Lord God, remove the turban and take off the crown. This will no longer be the same. Exalt that which is low and abase that which is high. A ruin, a ruin, a ruin. I will make it. This also will be no more until he comes, whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Notice the wicked one. He has these garments on. He has a turban and a crown. 
It's going to be taken from him, same as you see in Isaiah 22, and the garments are going to be given to the one whose right it is. That is the Messiah. A ruin, a ruin, a ruin probably corresponds to, if you can follow me, holy, holy, holy. God in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. A ruin, a ruin, a ruin, the Antichrist, Satan, and the false prophet. It probably means that. Okay. Let's reiterate it three times. When the Antichrist comes, he's going to come and become the prince of Israel. He's going to deceive the Jews into thinking he's a messianic figure. They will find out that he's lied and betrayed them with his eloquence and his deceit and his miracles. However, it'll be too late by then. But his kingdom will come to an end. He'll be destroyed. And what he has taken will be removed from him and given to the one whose right it is. That is the Lord Jesus. Notice, Antichrist always comes before Christ. He tries to imitate him at every single turn. When Jesus comes, he's going to be both king and priest. He is going to have both the crown of the king and the tunic and sash of the priest. He will reign from that temple. But Antichrist comes first. Well, let's continue. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 2. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given him. He's got a crown. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Notice... He comes on a white horse, conquering and to conquer, and he's got the crown. Why does he appear that way? Why does Antichrist, as the first horseman, come that way? Well, we know why. Let's look to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, please, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are flames of fire. On his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is the Lord Jesus. He comes back with the diadems on his head to conquer, as it were, on a white horse as it's portrayed. Antichrist attempts to counterfeit what Jesus is going to do, but he pre-counterfeits it. Jesus will reign from the millennial temple in Jerusalem for a thousand years. The Antichrist will reign from the tribulational temple in Jerusalem for three and a half years. Jesus had three and a half years. The Antichrist will have 42 months. Let's continue. Look with me, please to Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. There was given to him a mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. The public ministry of Jesus from the time of the wedding of Cana until his resurrection was 42 months, three and a half years. 
Satan will demand and be given equal time in the person of Antichrist. Notice he always counterfeits Jesus. Sometimes he pre-counterfeits Jesus. Sometimes he post-counterfeits Jesus. He will actually initially, in the first half of the seven years, attempt to counterfeit the millennium, and people will think, He's the messianic savior of the human race, initially. If possible, even the elect will be deceived. When Jesus came, there was John the Baptist, Yohanan Hamadbir. And we are told Elijah will come again in the book of Malachi. Jesus confirmed this in Matthew chapter 16 and 17. Elijah is going to come again. But there's a counterfeit. Just as Elijah comes before the Messiah, or John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah before the Messiah, so too the false prophet comes before the Antichrist. Again, I'd point you to our book, Shadows of the Beast. We go into these things, of course, in considerable detail. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 3. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who's like the beast? Who's able to wage war with him? Oh, it was given to him a mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act 42 months was given to him. Now, it may be that the Jews or some Orthodox religious Jew will assassinate him when he sets up the abomination in the temple. That's a possibility. I'm not teaching it dogmatically. But let's look. He has the authority 42 months. He opens his mouth and blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is, those who dwell in heaven. After the rapture, the real tabernacle of the Lord will be the saints gathered into heaven. At some point, very closely after the abomination is set up, at some point shortly after the abomination is set up is when the rapture and resurrection occur. Jesus made this clear. When you see the abomination set up, no, the time is impending. But let's move on. <clears throat> he counterfeits the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. People are amazed. They're stupefied. This guy is rose from the dead. He must be Christ. He must be of God. Well, let's move on. Look with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Please pay careful attention to this. talking of the king of Babylon, a major metaphor for Satan and a type of the Antichrist. Again, it's in the book, Shadows of the Beast. But in verse 12, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You've been cut down to the earth. Same as in Isaiah 22, he's cut down, destroyed. You've been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. 
Look what it says again. Star of the morning, sun of the dawn. The rabbis always interpret this as the bright one, the bright one in Judaism from ancient times. It relates, of course, to the term Lucifer, Satan coming as an angel of light. But look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, he's speaking here in the first person. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root, the Shoresh David, and the descendant of David. Notice he's both the root of David and he's the descendant of David. The bright and morning star. Now, doesn't bright and morning star sound very much like the star of the morning, the bright one of the morning, the sun of the dawn? Look at how closely the Antichrist will attempt with some success to counterfeit Christ the bright and morning star, star of the morning. What are we looking at here? Son of the dawn. The Antichrist is going to be very apt in many things, but all of his skills his satanically anointed skills are going to have one central purpose, to counterfeit the Lord Jesus, the bright and morning star, oh, the star of the morning, the sun of the dawn. It almost looks the same. I've read the testimonies of people saved out of Freemasonry and a few from the higher degrees, like the 32nd and 33rd degrees of Freemasonry. A few people have been saved from it. We have to understand that Freemasonry or theophists, they believe that God and Satan are ultimately the same that there's good and bad in man, and we're made in God's image or likeness, so there must therefore be good and bad in God. The bright and morning star, the star of the morning, sun of the dawn. They believe good and evil are two manifestations of the same divine essence. Now, this is satanic. It is known as Luciferianism, Luciferianism. I have warned many times that no saved Christian should be involved in Masonic lodges or anything like it. Let no one bind you with an oath, those blood oaths they take, and the Holy Royal Arch of the Third Degree, and Yabalon, and these things. No saved Christian should be involved with it. I realize many people get into it for social reasons, business reasons, professional reasons, to make contacts for their career advancement or their business interests, and they don't really believe the so-called craft. But it's the craft that's demonic. We should not be part of it. No saved Christian should be involved with anything Masonic. Not the Masons, not the Shriners, not the Rainbow Girls, none of that stuff. But let's go further. Look with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 4. The man of lawlessness who opposes and exalts himself 
above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Why does the Antichrist want to be worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem? Well, among other passages, the Hebrew prophet Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 12, tells us, because that's where Jesus, the Messiah, is going to be worshipped during the millennium. The Antichrist counterfeits the millennium. He counterfeits Jesus, and he wants to be worshipped in Jerusalem. Zechariah 14, 12 speaks of Jesus. Look with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 25, verse 5. Like heat and drought, you subdue the uproar of aliens. Like heat, by the shadow of the cloud, the song of the ruthless is silenced. Turn with me, please, to Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness, indeed, my decision is to gather nations to assemble kingdoms, to pour out my indignation on them, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. Because the world follows the beast, God's judgment on the beast will come on the world. Look with me, please, to the 110th Psalm. Psalm 110, verse 6. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will do it. Well, the Lord will make the enemies of Christ his footstool. Okay. Now we see this. Notice this happens. when the Messiah comes according to the order of Melchizedek. Remember, after the rescue of Lot from the kings of Sodom, there was the apparition of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a Christophany. We have a recorded teaching on, on Melchizedek, He's a Christophany, an Old Testament and fleshman of Christ, to whom Abraham comes with bread and wine and so forth and pays him a tithe and so forth. Okay. When he comes, the kings of Sodom are overthrown. When Jesus comes, the kingdom of Antichrist will be overthrown. And they will be associated with the sins of Sodom, as we have in our teaching tape, not even a minyan. Chapter, Revelation chapter 2, verse 27. The nations. Look at what we're told. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. 
as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. I have also received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. There it is again. Jesus comes with that authority. Jesus defeats the kings of Sodom, as it were. And Jesus gives the morning star, not to be confused with the son of the dawn, Lucifer, the star of the morning. He always tries to counterfeit. Look with me, please, to Psalm 5, verse 6. The boastful man, we know who that is. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. That is Antichrist. The Lord abhors the man of deceit. The Antichrist will be the biggest and most capable deceiver who has ever, ever lived. Look with me, please to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 62. Verses 6 to 8. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise upon the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his strong arm, I will never again give your grain as food for your enemies, nor will foreigners drink your new wine for which you have labored. We are actually told something incredible. As we see these signs coming like a watchman on the walls, we have to remind the Lord, not that he has amnesia, but persist in our prayers. And we're told, give God no rest. Remember what Jesus said about the woman who kept pestering the judge in the parable? Give God no rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth till the millennial reign of Christ is established. Give him no rest. The early Christians prayed, Mar Anata, come Lord, come Lord, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We are told as it were, to pester the Lord. Jesus, come. Come, Jesus. Jesus, come. Now, of course, we can hasten his coming, we're told in Peter, and we're told we will not finish evangelizing Israel until he comes in Matthew 10. We can play our role to make it happen faster. But part of the way we hasten his coming is to keep asking him to do it. He's usually slow, but he's never late. In his time, he will not tarry. In the way world events are moving, he doesn't seem to be tarrying much now. But let's look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. It was given to him to make war with the saints to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Notice what he tries to do. The Antichrist will set himself up as a counterfeit king of kings and lord of lords. Assisted by the false prophet and empowered by Satan, he will set himself up 
as the counterfeit of the true king of kings, Lord of lords. Look at me with me, please, to Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, Melech Hamlachim, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's the ultimate Basilea and the ultimate Kurios. In the person of Antichrist, Satan will counterfeit this up to a certain point with considerable success. Look with me, please, to Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Then the king will do as he pleases. He'll exalt and magnify himself above every god. He'll speak monstrous things against the God of gods. And he will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. He'll speak blasphemous things against the true God. And he will prosper in his wickedness for 42 months. This is shocking until the indignation that relates to the abomination of desolation, which he has decreed will be done. He'll prosper, he'll succeed in it. This will be the ultimate, ultimate counterfeit of Christ. Look at Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It's given to Jesus. But the Antichrist will seek to change the laws and the times, and they will be given into his hand for two times the time and a half time. Satan will get the equal time that Jesus had in public ministry, up to a point. He will prosper in his indignation up to that point. It will look as if all power and authority is given to him. But all power and authority is given to Jesus. Look at Zechariah eleven sixteen. I have been warning since the early 80s, this is a prophecy of the Antichrist. And I found somebody who agreed with me a hundred over a hundred years ago, uh, Arthur Pink, A.W. Pink. Uh, maybe I should talk about him sometime. But look with me to Zechariah chapter eleven, verse sixteen. For behold, I'm going to raise up a shepherd in the land, <clears throat> who will not care for the perishing, who will not seek the scattered heal the broken, or sustain the one standing. But he will devour the flesh of the fat sheep and tear off their hoofs. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword will be on his arm and on his right eye. His arm will be totally withered, and his right eye will be blind. In John 10, <clears throat> in John 10, Jesus is the good shepherd. In Zechariah, Antichrist is a bad shepherd. Now, we know this is talking about Antichrist because it is used in conjunction with the prophecy about the son of perdition, the son of perdition and the 30 pieces of silver. Okay. 
Whenever we see something about the son of perdition, the Holy Spirit is, of course, trying to tell us something about the Antichrist who is to come. And he's coming. Jesus will be the good shepherd. He will be a worthless shepherd, but he'll be in that position. What do we also know? We also know that he will look like a lamb, but he will speak like a dragon. He'll look like a lamb, but he will speak like a dragon. This is quite frightening. It's very frightening, but it's going to happen. Again, in Zechariah 11, they weighed out 30 shekels of silver, that magnificent price, a prophecy of Judas, the son of perdition, always talking about the Antichrist. When we enter into the Valley of Vision, we see what's happening. We see the master counterfeiter. He counterfeits things Jesus did do, but then he pre-counterfeits things that Jesus is going to do. This is very frightening and very troubling. Remember, if possible, the elect will be deceived. We keep saying that. And so many of the elect are being deceived already. I've warned about a number of ways. Saved Christians, born-again Christians, are being set up for this this counterfeit of Jesus, this counterfeit of the millennium. The first thing I've warned about, and I'm not here to say things we've said many times. The first thing I've warned about are those who forget that Jesus said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign and they follow the word faith money preachers, and they're always looking for a sign and a wonder. Now, I'm a, not a cessationist. I'm a continuationist. I believe the gifts of the Spirit still operate in the church. I do not agree with cessationism. I think it is doctrinal error. However, the signs and wonders movement and these miracle crusades, this hyper-charismatic and ultra-Pentecostal teaching, of the money preachers particularly, the Antichrist and false prophet are going to put on a show that will be unparalleled, unprecedented. It'll look like Jesus himself. It won't be these pathetic figures we see in the media. It'll be worse than that. And his mastery will be much better than theirs. Secondly, I've warned of Christians who have bought into the lie that the study of prophecy and the return of Christ is to be avoided as a diversion or as something that's not real. Again, I don't want to go into it at length, but the teaching of Rick Warren Avoid end-time prophecy, it's a diversion. That is from the devil. The teaching of Chris Roseborough, there's no antichrist, no falling away. The book of Revelation is not to be taken in any actual futuristic sense. It's There's not going to be a mark of the beast and not going to be an antichrist. These men are deceivers sent by the devil to deceive the elect. And Christians are following them. 
A third area I've warned about, perhaps not enough, are those who are deceived themselves, but who deceive others with an apparent intellectual credibility, a knowledge of literary criticism, biblical and church history, possibly archaeology, certainly of the biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, possibly Aramaic. People who seem to have an academic or intellectual credibility, educated Christians, as an alternative to the word faith nonsense preachers who are conspicuously foolish and false to them, are being drawn to people who seem intellectually credible. Now, again, I'm not a cessationist. And I do believe in scholarship if it's directed by the Holy Spirit. I do not demean charismatic gifts, signs and wonders. I simply demean the counterfeits taking place today. Likewise, I do not demean scholarship. I put a lot of efforts into biblical languages myself. Church history, literary criticism. I don't dismiss the importance of these things or the practical value. But let's look at this. And again, I don't say this by way of personal attack. Many people are taken in by John Piper. John Piper is a cessationist, kind of, in theory. Yet he's not. He led the Lectio Divina, visualization with Beth Moore, a hyper-charismatic woman who practices mysticism and Gnosticism. This was John Piper. John Piper believes in the era of replacement theology. He denies the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews in any national or literal sense. If you're teaching replacement theology, you're deceived, and you're deceiving others. But if you're on a platform with Bet Moore practicing mysticism, you're not just deceived, you're a deceiver. But he seems intellectually credible. I have never heard a teaching more dangerous more dangerous for the time in which we live than the teaching that it will be possible to take the mark of the beast, which entails the worship of Satan in the person of Antichrist, and still be saved. People see him as intellectually credible. They buy into his cessationism, they buy into his Calvinism, but then they buy into his lie of the devil. It is very, very, very dangerous. And it's his intellectual credibility that Satan uses to get people to swallow something most of them wouldn't swallow otherwise. I saw the thrones, Revelation 24. They sat on them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their right hand. And they came to life and raised with Christ for a thousand years, if it is possible for people to be saved after taking that mark, they would not have had to wait to the end of the millennium to come back to life. They would have reigned with Christ. They are in the judgment of the unrighteous. John MacArthur, 
apart from the financial scandals, he's an extremely dangerous man. He's wrong about cessationism. He's wrong about Calvinism. But he's more than wrong about the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. It is intellectual plausibility causes people to swallow the poison. Arsenic and a milkshake. Then there's a fourth. We've also touched on this various times, but perhaps it's appropriate to mention it again. Those who rightly understand that the tide of world events, politically, economically, strategically, they rightly understand that what's happening in the world is of prophetic significance, ultimately pointing to the return of Jesus. They rightly understand those things. To their credit, or to the mercy of the Lord who shows them, they are correct. But what happens is, in their realization that the political conflicts are reflections of spiritual conflicts, as we see in Daniel chapter 10, they become politically focused, looking for some kind of a political hope. And I've seen this on both sides of the equation. I know Christians in America, not all of them black, despite the fact that Barack Obama was pro-abortion radically, pro-partial birth abortion, despite the fact that most of the babies being aborted are black, they voted for him because he was black. They looked upon him as some kind of a political savior that was going to change the plight of American blacks. And it didn't. It couldn't. He's a wicked man. Without getting into the politics of it, even how black unemployment remains so consistently high under his eight years and so, that's not the point. He lit the White House up in the colors of the rainbow homosexual flag, the rainbow. The Supreme Court decision mandating legislating from the bench that had to be same-sex marriages. He pushed this and celebrated it. Abortion, partial birth abortion. He's a wicked man. But there were people who voted for him who said they were saved Christians. And not all of them were black people. By no means. And there were black people who were Christians who voted against him. Let's go to the other side. I'm only stating the facts. I remember when a Southern fundamentalist preacher and the president, I believe, of, it was the president of Liberty University, the premier academic institution of the evangelical church in America, certainly on the East Coast, he campaigned for Ronald Reagan, and he made the election of Ronald Reagan virtually a Christian cause. Well, without getting into Ronald Reagan's arming Iran and things like this, we know that Ronald Reagan was highly reliant upon the advice of his wife, and she was consulting fortune tellers and astrologers. Nancy Reagan was involved with fortune tellers and astrologers and advising her husband on that basis. This is witchcraft. Jerry Fulwell. There are many antichrists. They will come. One undisputed antichrist was Sun Young Moon, the Korean cult leader of the Unification Church. He claimed to be the Lord of the Second Advent, the return of Jesus. He said that Jesus failed in his mission. He's going to succeed when Jesus failed. He is the return of Christ. 
he gave Jerry Falwell a couple of million dollars for Liberty University. Jerry Falwell took the filthy lucre from the Antichrist and, or he's an Antichrist, and once he got the filthy lucre, brought him on a platform in front of the student body and faculty and hailed Moon as an unsung hero. He said his first wife was the Holy Spirit. After she died, he got another wife named Mother Moon. Now she's being lauded by Beth Moore. This was unbelievable. Open Antichrist. Paying filthy lucre to a major evangelical preacher. President of a Bible college, a university. Or with Mr. Reagan. It's the Christian thing to do. And his wife is going to Gene Dixon. Fortune tellers? Witches? Astrologers? It's really happened. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I prayed for him daily and still do. The same time I know that the Antichrist is going to make a false peace in the Middle East. I have no doubt that Mr. Reagan was not what people thought. With Mr. Trump, I don't think he was a man of bad intention. Jared Kushner, I do not know, but I do know the Abraham Accords are one of the things that point to the Antichrist going to bring a false peace to the Middle East. No Christ, no peace. Yet so many Christians got caught up in it and the false prophecies of his re-election by Pat Robinson, who's made so many false prophecies, you could fill the New York yellow pages with them. And others. Those Christians who look for some kind of a political salvation, praying for the leaders is one thing, trusting in them is another. It is a way Christians have been deceived by a spirit of Antichrist. It's already happened. Both left and right. Democrat, Republican, it's happened both ways. A wicked and adulterous generation seeking a sign? It's happened, and it is happening. And when the Antichrist and false prophets show up, it's really going to happen like the world has never seen it. They're going to counterfeit the sign of his return in the cosmos. Intellect? Intellect consecrated to God can be a good servant, but it's a bad master. Just because somebody seems to be intellectually credible doesn't mean they're teaching the truth. The Antichrist is going to be a very eloquent man who's going to be, among other things, a theological genius. It's setting the stage. It's setting the stage. Doesn't matter if it's the political, the intellectual. Doesn't matter if it's the counterfeit charismatic. It doesn't matter if it's those who deny the importance of prophecy. Warren and Roseboro, people like this. Doesn't matter. Intellect doesn't matter. John Piper, the, the MacArthur, doesn't matter. The political, it doesn't matter.
what I'm saying is something I've said before. Just as the Holy Spirit is preparing the true church for the coming of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the harlot church for the coming of the Antichrist. And many true believers are falling for the lies. The Lord does not want us to be deceived. Our ministry is Moriel, Moriel, God is my teacher. God is your teacher. If God speaks through a man, that's God's sovereign gifting to the church through that person. Do not trust or follow any man, including this one. Do not trust or believe James Jacob Prash. Please don't trust me or believe me. But you can trust and believe this. This is not my way. You can agree with me to the exact extent I agree with this. You can follow me to the exact extent I am following Jesus Christ. You can believe what I say to the exact extent I believe what he says. His spirit will show you who is true, who is false. What is true? What is false? I'm very troubled. Many sincere Christians, people who are actually born again, are not understanding what's really happening. Unless we understand what Satan is doing, we cannot understand what God is doing. And unless we understand, first of all, foremostly what God is doing, we cannot understand what Satan is trying to counterfeit. There is a valley. There is a valley. The mountain will come later, but first there is a valley. And that valley is the Valley of Vision. Thank you so much for listening. May the Lord Jesus bless every one of you, keep you and your family. God bless. Have a good weekend.